So the, the main um, purpose of this is to really share some insight I got while developing the tool um, and also to make sure that people who are going to be using the tool in the future really understand um, you know, what, what the, the foundation of the tool, what it's, so, so you have an understanding of their strengths and weaknesses. Um, so if I can find a button, that, there we go. So the first aim is just to give some insight into plume behaviour. Um, we discovered while I was developing the tool. Um, and then to introduce the, the PFT itself um, and demonstrate its prediction potential. And then the, the last step um, is to sort of like a practical how to calculate the PFT. So the, the idea is to demonstrate on a thermodynamic diagram. Now, I don't expect anyone will actually have to do this, but just by going through the process, you really understand the PFT. And it does mean if you just look at a, a, a thermodynamic diagram, you'll be able to eyeball it and say, okay, I can see um, what the, 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 the pyrocb potential is today from this trace. So, um, now, th this is going to be some really, really basic stuff. This, I've, I've taken this from uh, an article um, that I prepared recently for the Asia Pacific Bio Magazine. So it's, it's for a like, lay audience. So um, don't feel, please don't feel like I'm being condescending here. Uh, I'm sure it's really obvious. So for a conventional thunderstorm, we, we have a warm, moist layer. And there's, a, there's an unstable layer above that. Um, often going up to the tropopause, and there's a stable barrier in between. Before a thunderstorm will form, we need some form of lift to get that warm, moist layer to penetrate the stable barrier, and then cloud will form, um, and the cloud releases the instability. So um, the main difference with the fire thunderstorm, or the Pyro CB, is that the fire provides the lift. It's the buoyancy of the, the smoke plume that provides the lift. Um, but it also adds heat and moisture. So the plume is a little bit warmer and a little, little bit moister than the environment. So if it, essentially what this means is that the, you might have an environment that is not unstable for conventional thunderstorms, but by adding the extra um, heat and moisture, uh, you can turn that environment into something that is unstable for Pyro CB. This is important, an important distinction. Um, and the, the, the main thing, of course, is that the, the, the plume provides this sort of um, buoyancy boost that allows it to punch through the stable layer. And throughout this presentation, I'll talk about the buoyancy as a delta theta. It's, the, it's, it's how much warmer the plume is than the environment where theta represents potential temperature. So we got that delta theta there, punching through the stable um, barrier. And oh, we've gone to, uh, I'm not sure what happened there, but anyway. And then the cloud forms, and um, we have the Pyro CB. So what do we need in the plume? We need height. It must rise high enough for the cloud to form. This is the free convection height. This is a term that I use throughout the presentation. So the delta theta you can see there, and the free convection height you'll see them often. And the buoyancy, it needs to have sufficient buoyancy to penetrate any stable layer that might be present between the, this condensation level and the electrification level, which we often use as, as um, at minus 20 degrees C. Um, so now some insight into um, the, the, the Briggs plume model, which is the, the foundation of, of the PFT. Now what many people don't, understand is this really, really simple model it explains really well um, plumes from a variety of scales. So here we have a candle flame. And here we have you know, the, the traditional smokestack. And then a big chemical fire and, of course, bushfires. Now, the model is extremely simple. And it, it's taken you know, uh, really um, taken very, very complex behavior and, and um, reduce it down to a single equation. But what that equation is describing is not the plume structure, not none of these turbulent um, processes or anything like that. It's the plume envelope that the, um, the, the, the that contains the plume. 
And it includes the effects of turbulence, obviously, because it's the turbulence that it leads to entrainment that causes the plume to grow. So if we have a fire here, and the firepower or the, um, the heat flux entering the plume is expressed in the Briggs model as a buoyancy flux, that red term there, you'll see that appearing often as well. So we, if we add some coordinate axes, we've got height z and downstream distance x. And then if we consider a background wind, u, and the equations describe the plume center line, which would look like this. And there's also um, the, the assumption in the, plume, in the Briggs model is that the plume surface, the outer surface surrounding the center line, is an expanding circular cross section that looks like that. So the radius of that circle is directly proportional to the free convection height, Zc in that equation. So beta is a constant. And now we get the wonderful Briggs plume center line equation. Um, now don't worry, it looks confusing, but I'll, I'll spend some time going through it. Now what, what you'll notice is there's only two variables in there that change the shape of that plume because beta is constant and pi is just the, the circle constant, and x is one of the coordinate direction, directions. So the only two terms that change the shape of that plume is the buoyancy flux, as in the, the heat or the firepower, and the background wind speed. So if we would consider the a plume condensation level, so it, our plume's got to get up to this height if we're going to get cloud to form. Um, so what needs to change in this particular situation for a larger fraction of the plume to reach the condensation height? Now, this is where I turn to the audience. The audience would chime in with answers, but given um, our audience don't have access to the microphone, I'll just say, yes, you're correct. We need to increase the firepower. That's one thing we can do because that's uh, in the numerator of that equation. And of course, the other, what about the background wind? That's in the denominator, so we need to reduce the background wind if we want that plume to stand up tall. Now, this is all fairly obvious. We, we know that if we have a hotter plume, we end up with a, a tall, uh, sorry, a hotter fire, we end up with a taller plume. Or if we reduce the wind speed, we end up with a taller plume. So let's quantify this relationship. What would it take to double the plume height? Um, to, so to go from the left plot to the one on the right there. Now, looking at the equation, we can see we could increase the buoyancy flux by eight times because the, the power of the third there is a cube root. Or, uh, yeah, or we could halve u. So this is telling us that the plume shape is much more sensitive to the background wind than it is to firepower. Now, this is a surprise, I think, to most people I, I show this to because whenever... Um, well, often when we think about changing plume behaviour, we often think, oh, well, it must have gone through an area of really dense fuels or it must have had a, a, a sudden run or something like that. Um, there must have been a real big change in, in the firepower. This is actually suggesting that it might actually just be a, a, a lull in the winds. And we know that during turbulent um, uh, you know, days when we get these deep mixed layers and strong winds, there's a lot of turbulence, and, and the turbulence, um, it, the turbulent time scale can be of the order of 20 minutes, and so you might get um, variations in wind speed that are happening over over a 20-minute time period, which could um, just as easily explain changes in plume structure that we're seeing. So, what about the buoyancy that we mentioned earlier? Um, so here we have a very bent over plume with a beautiful pyro CB. This is from the Sedgley Road fire um, from, uh, that Nick McCarthy uh, observed. I've actually flipped the image to get it to face the, the right direction. So it matches our Briggs plume diagram. Um, and there's a very minimal stable layer in this case. The delta theta on that plot is about one degree, maybe two. So you get a very, very flat plume in that, in that instance. Um, here we have the bald fire from California. There the delta theta was, theta was about 10 degrees. And we end up with a, a really steep plume there because there's a strong, a strong stable layer. 
And the reason is, if you've got a strong stable layer, you've got to have lots of energy. It's got to be going up fast if it's going to penetrate that stable layer. If you have a weak stable layer, then it can just um, fizzle along and, um, and, and be very, very flat by the time it finally reaches the, the condensation level and goes up. Should I continue or? Okay. All right. So, so we have a general, okay, general rule of thumb. The steeper the plume at the condensation level, the more buoyant the plume. And this is really, could, could be quite useful information. For if you imagine you, you see a plume going up and um, it, it starts, you start to see some condensation, a bit of cloud forming. If it's going up really steeply, it's really tall, then it's obviously got buoyancy and it's going to go higher. If you know you have a stable layer, um, then in it's going up tall, you say, okay, there's a good chance it's going to break through that stable layer and um, perhaps we'll get some pyro CB. If on the other hand, it's just flattening right out before the pyrocumulus starts to form, then you can look at it and say, okay, um, clearly it hasn't got much energy. It's not very buoyant. And so if there is a stable layer, it's, it's unlikely to go through unless you see you know, a big change in the, in the uh, firepower or the background wind speed that causes it causes it to start standing up a bit taller. Okay, so the plume needs buoyancy at the condensation level if it is to penetrate stabilize above. And here's, here we've reintroduced the dashed line to represent the, the condensation layer. And the steeper the plume at the condensation layer, the greater the buoyancy. Um, so let's again, let's go back to our example where we um, double the plume height and slope by um, halving the wind speed, what we end up with in that case is twice the buoyancy because the buoyancy equation looks like this and you can see that the U is, is in the denominator. But you'll also notice that if we double the plume height and double the, the, um, the steepness by increasing the buoyancy flux instead of reducing the wind, we have actually made the plume eight times as buoyant. Um, so this is useful because it, it's essentially telling us if you see an upright plume in really, really strong winds, you know it's extremely buoyant. Whereas if you see an upright plume in light winds, you can say, okay, it's buoyant, but it's not, it won't be as buoyant. Um, oh, and I'll just go back and point out another thing that I discovered uh, more recently is that if you look at how close, um, so if you look at the, the top left panel and look at the upper um, line, uh, the line defining the upper part of the Briggs plume there and see where it crosses the red dash line and then have a look at it um, in the lower right one. It's almost three times closer to the fire. So it's actually, it's, it's the square root of eight um, is how much closer it is to the fire. And it's that much steeper as well. So we may, may have doubled the plume height um, by halving the U or increasing the buoyancy flux by eight times, but we brought the plume almost three times close to the fire, which means it has a much greater chance of interacting with the fire and causing um, you know, uh, uh, um, accelerations of airflow into the fire. So just to summarize this, we, ne we know that pyro CV require tall plumes to get to the condensation level. Um, Pyrocy B need to be buoyant, uh, so we need to have sufficient buoyancy to penetrate any stable layers between the condensation level and the electrification level. And the plume structure is much more sensitive to changes in wind speed than firepower. As we, we mentioned, if we halve U or increase the buoyancy flux by eight times, either one will get us a double the, the plume height. And the steeper the plume in general, the greater the buoyancy. Um, so it give, gives that useful insight into um, whether the plume is likely to have the energy to penetrate the stable layer. Um, and of course, steep plumes and strong winds equals a very large buoyancy. So that's the end of the, the first part of this um, presentation. Um, the second part is really describing the PFT itself. Um, so it's the minimum heat flux or firepower or buoyancy flux are all approximately the same thing. They're all proportional to one another. 
um, required for pyro-CB to form. So, and it obviously it varies with the atmospheric environment. So here we have uh, a photo of a fire. Clearly there's no cumulus, it's just puffing along. And we could say that in this instance, we have insufficient firepower for pyro-CB. Now, if we kept um, bumping up the firepower, increasing, increasing, increasing it, until we just get to this situation here where we're just reaching pyro CB. We now have sufficient firepower. Um, and so this is what we're looking for. We're looking for that transition between not enough to just enough. So we're trying to identify this threshold amount of firepower um, that will allow the pyro CB to form. The, the good thing is we don't need to know anything about the fires. Uh, we're just looking at what the threshold quantity is to allow pyro-CB to form in any particular environment. So we use the Briggs plume model. Um, so here we, I've just put in, uh, zoomed in a picture of the, the plume in that um, uh, the, the Sedgley Road fire from the, the image we showed before. And he, at this height here we have the condensation level. Um, so what we're trying to find is a free convection height at which some fraction of the plume alpha um, exceeds this free convection height. And we know that there's almost always a stable layer there. And so we know that we need to have sufficient buoyancy, this delta theta term, to penetrate that stable layer. <clears throat> and one of the Briggs equations describes the distribution of buoyancy along that center line from the the fire source. So in th that equation, if you have the, if you know how much heat is going in, it, it tells you the buoyancy all the way up. So if, if we invert that equation, we can using the delta theta, the u, and the zfc, we can actually work out um, how much firepower is required to get the plume up to that height. And the equation looks like this. Now, fortunately, this part is approximately constant. And you can see that the PFT is proportional to the free convection height squared multiplied by the wind speed multiplied by this delta theta, this buoyancy term. Um, and you obviously, let's uh, see, does it pass the pub test? So if we look at the free convection height term, obviously the larger the plume must rise, the more firepower is required. Um, in the stronger the background wind, the more firepower required to counter the plume's tendency to bend over. And the larger the capping inversion requires a hotter plume and thus more firepower. Now these are really quite intuitive results. And I think if anyone really thought about it, they'd say, yep, we knew this already. But what's new is how those terms fit together. Um, so we, it's a free convection height squared multiplied by the wind speed, multiplied by delta theta. So that's really important because we know that if we get a, a say a cold front or a sea breeze or something impacting the fire, the air is cooler and moister, so your free convection height reduces dramatically. Your wind speed might reduce also. But the delta theta, if you've got cold air moving underneath a warm layer, the delta theta could be huge, could be really quite substantial. So a typical um, wind change is going to lead to reduce ZFC and reduce U, but increase delta theta. So what is the net effect? Is it more favourable or less favourable for the for um, pyro CB formation? Now it turns out it's almost always more favourable, and that's because the ZFC term is squared. Um, so the ingredients we can get them from a thermodynamic diagram, and I won't go through the details on how to do that here right now because the part three of this presentation is actually going to take you through that um, that process. Uh, oh, but what I will say is that we just need a, a column of data like um, a, a sounding from a balloon um, or we can also work, work calculate the value at every grid point in a forecast model. And then if we take each grid point and we contour the values, we end up with the, the plot on the left there, um, which is the PFT. And the color scale is logarithmic. So we've got one down the bottom, then 10, 100, and 1,000. And the units are gigawatts. And this is um, an image from a forecast 
a six hour forecast for the surviving fire at about the time that the um, Pyro CB went off that you can see in the picture there. And you can see that there's a band um, that's approached the fire from the, uh, the, the southwest. Um, and th this is on or just before a wind change. And you can see ahead of the, the, the band, we've got white, which is off the scale, so it's greater than 1,000 gigawatts. And then there's a minimum of around 300 gigawatts um, at the time of that image. So it's another example here down at Lycola, which is earlier in this year in, in eastern Victoria. And you can see on the wind change there, there was a value of about 10 gigawatts. Um, so these are dramatically different. Um, so they're demonstrating a vastly different threat value. So it, at Lycola, we would only need a 10 gigawatt fire to generate power CB. Whereas at Sir Ivan, we, we needed 300 gigawatts. 30 times the, the firepower to get the Pyro CB to happen at Sir Ivan then at Lycola. If we can believe the theory, of course. Um, so, but the main difference was that Sir Ivan had extreme fire conditions or catastrophic or code red, however you like to, to call it, whereas um, Lycola only had um, uh, very high fire conditions. Um, so, any Forecasters looking at this are going to start to feel a little dismayed because how are we ever going to know whether it's a, a 10 gigawatt fire or a 300 gigawatt fire? Don't worry, it gets worse. Here is the PFT for late April this year. Um, in that plot is most of New South Wales and Victoria. And I haven't changed the colour scale. We'll just flip back and forth. So, what it's showing is that we're really down in the 1 to 10 to 15 gigawatts for the most of the domain. Now, on that day, we had cool autumn conditions. The Darling River um, had, uh, catchment had just received 75 millimetres of rain. I think it was the first time the river had flowed in, in months or years. Um, and at Burke there, we diagnosed 1 gigawatt. Now, compare that with the 300 gigawatts we diagnosed for Sir Ivan. Down here at Mount Buller, it's foggy and we diagnose five gigawatts. So, but what we do know is large hot fires are virtually impossible in these conditions. Um, so it, essentially conditions that highly favor pyro CB do not favor intense fires. And the reason for that is really quite obvious. It's because if you, the, the perfect conditions for plume development is warm, moist with light winds. Whereas the perfect conditions for hot fires is hot, dry and windy. So we need to incorporate the fire potential either within the diagnostic itself or separate to the diagnostic. So what we came up with was a, a flag. The flag was designed to alert users when it's time to examine the PFT. Now, as it turns out, the flag itself is looking like it might be a better forecast diagnostic than the PFT. Although I'm not suggesting anyone doesn't look at the PFT because there's lots of useful information in that and particularly the ingredients that go into it. So we return back here to the Sir Ivan case. Um, so one of the ingredients of the flag is a fire danger index. Now, I experimented with a number of indices and it was a combination that included the best function that appeared to work best. So this is just the atmospheric component of the VESTA function. And in order to separate information about the fuels and the atmosphere in the VESTA function, you have to assume that you have a high fuel load and that it's dry. Um, so everything we see from here on assumes a high fuel load and dry conditions. So um, the scale is at 0 to 30. Um, and the, you might be able to make out a pink line, which is also reproduced in the PFT plot above. And that's value is, is 15 on this VESTA function and it roughly, it's roughly equivalent to 50 on the FFDI, which is where we, we usually um, uh, give a total fire ban. And the white is off the scale, that's roughly equivalent to 100 in the FFDI and so that's your catastrophic or code red. So you can see that um, in the Sir Ivan region they had been experiencing catastrophic fire conditions for the hours leading up to this time. Uh, for those who are interested in sea haze, this is what it looked like. Um, it was greater than 10 at this time and it had been greater than 14 for most of the day. 
but as you'll notice, the at the time that the Pyrus EB went off, it wasn't the time peak C. Haynes. We often see that. The, you have high C. Haynes throughout the day, but when the Pyrus EB goes off, we actually have reduced C. Haynes. Then the PFT flag itself is up here. So what I did was I took the PFT, the top left plot, and divided it by this Vesta function, the bottom left, and I also divided it by the near surface wind speed. Um, now note the, the the vectors, the wind vectors you see in all of these plots is the mixed layer wind speed, so that deep layer wind speed, the, that you, the, the U term in green you've seen in the previous plots, not the near surface wind speed. So, so the PFT flag is a PFT divided by Vesta, divided by the near surface wind speed, and the colour scale was chosen so that we got some nice colours for Sir Ivan and also for Lycoma. So it's just, it's, it's, it's randomly, almost randomly put together. And I thought if it works for Sir Ivan, an extreme case, and it works for Lycoma, um, a, a much a milder phytoengine conditions, I'm hoping it'll work for everything in between. So far, it looks like it might. Um, so just notice that the flag's triggered on the wind change. Um, and the other thing is to note that the flag is narrower than the region of shaded PFT. And what that's saying is that um, the, although the, the PFT hasn't changed that much, the fire danger has. So right on the, the wind change, you have, the, you have um, extreme enough fire uh, conditions to generate a plume that's, um, that can exceed 300 gigawatts. Back behind the wind change, the fire danger is much lower and we're, it's assuming that the fires will not be, now will not be hot enough to reach the 300 gigawatts. Okay, so Lycola, just to give uh, the, the opposite extreme, um, you can see um, the, the blue star and the red star in the PFT and the PFT flag identi identify the location of the fire. And we had high fire danger, or maybe very high throughout the day. C. Haynes was less than 10 all day. Um, so if you're using C. Haynes as your indicator of the potential for piracy, but you would have missed it on this day. Um, so that was 11 a.m. And my button's not working anymore. Oh, have we, we've lost connection. We'll pause everyone. Okay, it looks like we're back. I'll just see if I can move back to the 11 a.m. plot. Okay, so you can see there that the we're, we're up and running again. It's okay, so yep, and I'm continuing with the show. Good going, mate. Okay, all right. So there, there it is, 11 a.m. Um, and if we jump ahead a few hours. Uh, actually, the computer. Oh, over there. Oh, it yeah, started. It's gone black again. So, you press the right button. I mean, so over there. So. 
changes next year and quick. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay, so we're, we're back again. Um, and I'll try and get it back to. Okay, here we go. 11 a.m. So now we jump ahead four hours, 3 p.m. You can see that the, the PFT is getting darker, and you can also see a big change in the color in the VESTA function, which is identifying um, much increased um, fire danger. And also up. Um, the PFT flag in the top right, you can see um, speckle the patches of, of the flag going off. Now that's because we, we're resolving the topography and the higher the topography, the lower the effective value of the free convection height. And because the free convection, the PFT is proportional to the free convection height squared, you see quite a, um, a strong sensitivity to the topography there. Then jump ahead to 5 p.m. And this is the image I showed before. Now, you can see the 10 gigawatt region hasn't quite reached the fire at this stage. It's, the fire is experiencing 100 gigawatt. But if you look at the PFT flag, you can see that the, the area that's darkest, so the highest threat, is actually um, in, in the flow immediately preceding the wind change. We see this again and again and again. And it's largely due to an acceleration of the winds as the wind change approaches. And, you, and the, it's, it's evident in the, in the VESTA function as well, in the darker colors there. Um, so, and, and I think one thing to keep in mind, of course, is that the, the 10 gigawatt region is about to hit the fire. And if you have a look at the VESTA function for the 10 gigawatt region and the, and the PFT flag, it's not actually that dark. And the main reason is it's the cooler and moister conditions have reduced the fire danger. But we need to keep in mind that the, the atmosphere or the fuels actually take some time to, to respond. So uh, just because the flag has gone a little bit paler right on the wind change, uh, we shouldn't interpret that to mean that the, the threat has reduced. It's probably actually gone up. Um, yeah, again, yeah, again, just raising the point that it's on the wind change. It's almost always on the wind change that we see the, the, the greatest threat. Um, now, we get very few opportunities to verify the PFT. Um, there's just, the observations are just not out there. Um, so, but we can verify the PFT flag because we either have PyroCV or we don't. Um, so here's a case where I've got 10 minute intervals from the Hotham webcam in which there are two fires um, burning. We've got the closer one on the left of the village, which is the Mayford Tuck Along Track Fire, and then in, in the distance to the right of the village is, is the Mount Darling Cynthia Range Track Fire. Now the, the PFT and the PFT flag are up on the, on the top left and top right, respectively, and they're effectively one hour forecast. So what, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll um, move through the, the images at 10 minutes and they will catch up to the forecast and then I'll move the forecast ahead with an hour and then we'll catch up with the images. So if I just move through now, you can see some really impressive cumulus uh, developing in both fires. Um, but we'd ask the question, we're probably not pyro CB. They're, they're tall, there's no sort of sign of, of um, rain or, or anything to suggest that they're pyro CB yet. And that's consistent with the PFT flag, which is um, it, well, it's being triggered nearby, but not in the vicinity of that yellow star. So if you focus now on the PFT flag, as I step forward, you can see that it's got darker um, in the general area and it's progressed a little bit further south. I'll just go back and forth with that. And this is a pattern you'll see throughout the afternoon it gets darker which means the conditions are becoming more favorable and it's progressing further south so now i'll just loop through the images you can see some really impressive um, plumes and some dark colors under them suggesting perhaps some rain but do we have rcb i'm not sure so focus again on the top right and you can see the the difference as we we sh shift ahead an hour and now lo loop through the 10 minute photos that um, are catching up to this forecast pyro CB. Um, 
reasonable chance we might have something on that uh, the the left one at this stage because it's really dark but we're not certain yet um and just continue with that and now it's there's a really large anvil um, almost certainly pyro cb on the left one and then we move ahead another hour and you see that the more distant fire goes up and is a or the plume goes up there's a nice pyro cb anvil evident there so this is really good um validation um, of, of the the product um as i said it was tuned to suit sir ivan and lycola and here's a completely independent case where it appears to be working quite well and we've also been running it in forecast mode now for about three months and it appears to work quite well so just to summarize this part of the, the presentation, we use the Briggs model to determine the, the PFT. And the equation looks like this. Um, and we plot the spatial maps to determine the pyro CB favorability. But of course, we had the, the issue with um, the fact that you know, sometimes you're going to generate a really, really hot fire and other times you won't. So we had to introduce the PFT flag. And then we applied it to about 30 cases, uh, case studies, and it looked really promising for each one. And now we've been applying it um, in, in real time forecast mode as an experimental um, diagnostic. And that's the end of that presentation. Um, what I'll try and do now is, is load up the, um, the next part of the presentation, which is the process of how to calculate the PFT manually. So bear with me a moment. Okay, so the next step, as I mentioned before, is about um, just illustrating the process of um, how to calculate the PFT manually on an F-160 or, sorry, a thermodynamic diagram. Um, so each page here, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take you through step by step. And the, there's a photo in the top right, and that's just to give you the background of why we're doing each step. So here we have an image of a plume, um, and the, the, the plume is sampling air from every level as it rises. So all that turbulence you can see in the plume there, that's, um, that turbulence is dragging air from the environment out and into the plume. Um, so you know, effectively, you've got air, air from the environment coming in every step of the way, and it's diluting the plume. Um, and actually, when you get up to the condensation level, the plume is probably somewhere between 95 to 99% environment air, just a small fr fraction of combustion gas. So the environment is really, really important. Um, so the entrained air is the average from every level. So what we need to determine is a, a mixed layer potential temperature. This is the theta ML and a mixed layer specific humidity, the QML. So we, 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 we just come up with an approximate um, value by throwing in a line that roughly it's a constant um, potential temperature that roughly matches that trace and we bias it slightly upwards because the plume actually entrains more air from the environment the higher up it goes and we do the same with the, or the in this case it's 45 degrees C oh, I should mention this trace is not actually a fire trace this is just a really useful trace it's from Sejuna, which is in the middle of a desert somewhere in South Australia. Um, and, but it has this nice uh, capping inversion, which helps to illustrate the process. And then the, the mixed layer uh, um, specific humidity is this blue line. And in this case, it's seven grams per kilogram. So what we do is extend those two lines to get the mixed layer lifting condensation level. Um, now, this is, this is the point the plume would condense if it had become so dilute that it was 99.99% environment air. But we, we, we don't know um, that the, the, in reality, the plume might be much more 
combustion gas than this. So the next step um, is, to, is to introduce this saturation point curve. It's, it's, it's identifying where the plume would condense if it had more combustion gas, um, if it had 1% or 2% or 5% or 10% combustion gas. So to, to get that far, we consider a fire and we assume that it produces heat and moisture in the ratio of a 10 degree C uh, temperature boost per one gram per kilogram uh, moisture boost. Um, and that's the number that, that I've come up with that roughly fits the, the middle range of possibility um, from a paper by Luder et al. And um, yeah, you can look that one up or I can provide some, some references later. Um, so what that means is we can add, say, 20 Kelvin or degree C, whichever um, units you want to use here, um, and of potential temperature and two grams per kilogram of, to the um, specific humidity. And where those two lines intersect, we put a star and we join the two LCLs with this blue line here. Now that approximates the saturation point curve. So that approximates, it tells us that the plume will condense somewhere on that line. And where it depends what, what fraction of environment air to combustion gas it is. If it's um, more combustion gas, sorry, if, it, if it's almost entirely environment air, then it's going to be at the mixed layer LCL. And then if it's a little bit of combustion gas, it's a little bit further along the line. If it's more combustion gas, it's, even, it's a bit further along the, the line. So we need to work out the free convection height. Now, just as a reminder, it's the, the height the plume must rise for it to condense with enough buoyancy to exceed the minus 20 degree C level. So it's got to get to the electrification level. So that's this term ZFC, which we've been um, using earlier. Um, so what we do is we find the smallest moist adiabat um, that reaches the minus 20 de degree C electrification level that is just clear of the temperature trace that's the red line everywhere between the saturation point curve that blue line and the minus 20 de degree isotherm and that's what it looks like in this case this yellow line here you can see it's um, everywhere between the saturation point curve and the t equals minus 20 degree c line it is to the right of the red temperature trace so it's more buoyant it's everywhere between those two levels, it's more buoyant. Okay, so ZFC is simply the height above the surface of the intersection between the moist adiabat and the saturation point curve. So that's how high we need to get this plume to rise um, in order for it to condense and have sufficient buoyancy to go all the way up to, to the T equals minus 20 degrees C line. Here, it's 4.8 kilometres. But remember, if you're using a trace from a nearby um, sounding station, the chances are the height of your fire will be different. And even you know, like a few hundred metres can have a substantial difference in your, your final PFT calculation. So make sure you subtract the, the actual height if it's more elevated than your site, or add height if it's, if it's lower. OK, so. The next thing is to find this free convection theta increment, this delta theta that we've been talking about. Um, so effectively what that means is it's the difference between the plume potential temperature at the free convection height, the theta plume here, and the mixed layer potential temperature, which is what we determined earlier with that red line. Um, so delta theta, the difference between these two lines, um, and theta plume, of course, is just the potential temperature at the free convection height. So it's a potential temperature at the intersection of the saturation point curve and that yeah, the blue, the dark blue line and the yellow line there. And the difference, you just have eyeball it and calculate it, delta theta in this case is about eight degrees. So we now have this term. So the next step is the mixed layer wind speed. Um, so if you, here's our plume again. It's the, it's the average wind in the mixed layer. And the reason why we need the average wind is because the Briggs equation is really, really simple. And there's only one value for the wind in the Briggs equation. So we take the average um, and 
So we, we look at the wind barbs in the mixed layer and they show values roughly between 20 to 40 knots. And on average, that might be about 30 knots. Now we want at, um, units of meters per second. So we divide the 30 by two to get 15. So we have a value of 15 meters per second here. So now we've got all the ingredients. We just need to put them together. Now remember what we're actually looking for is the total firepower entry the plume, or, or really it's the, the, it's the, the minimum firepower required to enter the plume for the Pyro CB to form. If you look, this is the Elephant Hill fire, fantastic image there. You can see um, the tiny, tiny little plumes, you know, hundreds of these tiny plumes right at the edge of the fire. And as they rise, they merge and they form larger plumes. And then the larger plumes merge until you end up with almost a single plume. And um, so this is why the the the, um, the tool appears to be working because it doesn't really matter. The, ge the geometry of the fire is not that important because the smoke or the heat and the smoke has to rise through, um, it takes the path of least resistance, which is a circular section. And above the minimum circle or the neck of, of the plume, it behaves roughly like a Briggs plume. So that's this area here. So we're just looking at all of the heat that's coming out of that fire that's going into the plume. Um, and the equation looks like this. P of T is approximately 300 times the free convection height squared times delta theta times U. Now, it's actually more useful if we use um, the units of kilometers for the free convection height, and then we can divide that constant out the front by 1,000, and it'll give us um, units of gigawatts. Um, so in this case, we've got P of T is 0.3 times ZFC squared delta theta U, um, which yields 830 gigawatts. Now that's a lot compared to the 300 um, for Sir Ivan and the 10 of Lycola. But as I said earlier, this is actually not, um, a, it's not a trace where there was a, an observed pyro CV. It was just a, a useful one for illustrating the process. Um, so, at, at this stage, if we had the, the if we were running the original planned um, gathering, we'd all get out with some um, thermodynamic diagrams and our pens and papers, and we'd start practicing drawing these things. I think just doing that is a really, really helpful, useful exercise. Um, going through the process really helps to um, get a good sense of what's going on. So the next thing is actually. I just want to introduce the, the dom domains that are available at the moment and that we'll um, tend to have available over this summer period. Um, so we have an Australia-wide dom domain. Um, we have a Western Australian dom domain. Um, now, originally when I put this together, I thought I might have some size limitations. So I didn't include a domain that took in all of Western Australia. I might change that. Um, South Australia. Um, we've got Vic Taz, and we've got New South Wales and Queensland. You can see Queensland's much greater than in scale than WA, which was after I introduced Queensland, I realised it could go larger, so I'll probably do that. Um, and so the, at the moment, we're currently limited to 36 hour forecasts at six hourly time intervals. So that means it's, you can do six to 46 hours. And I have extended New South Wales and Queensland and the Australian region out to 72 hours by running the script again, and it goes from 42 to 72 hours. So I can do that for all the other domains, but I'm just waiting for interest before I, I do that. There are two files for each forecast period or domain, and one looks like this. So the, the top left is the PFT, and then the top right is the, the, the free convection height, and then top, the bottom left is U, bottom right is delta theta. So these are the three main ingredients that go into the PFT. These provide really, really useful information about the expected plume behavior. Um, it tells you, you know, if you've got light winds um, and um, a, a large delta theta, for example, you know your plume's going to be upright and it's gonna, it needs to have lots of buoyancy to punch through um, the, 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 the stable layer. If delta theta is really small, we know that a plume that's just barely making it 
to the pre-convection height could generate a beautiful pyro CB. Um, and in that case, it will be very highly bent over. Uh, so there's really useful information in just in the ingredients there. Then the second plot is the, the PFT in the top left, the PFT flag, the Vesta function, and the C Haynes, which I've been showing earlier. Now, um, notice that the PFTs in the two look different. That's because the, the different scales used. Um, the one on the right is log base 10, and the one on the left is log base 2. And the reason I'm, I've done that is to help identify um, the fine variation in two different um, ranges. One, you know, focusing on below 500, and one's focusing on above 500 or, or thereabouts. Um, so if anyone wants access to these plots, the process is to send me an email um, saying that you've attended the, this training session and you wish to start receiving the, the forecast plots, let me know which domains you want. Um, and then I will send an email back to you uh, with a disclaimer that you will have to sign. But we'll just say, yes, I agree to these conditions and then I can add your name to the list. And that's it. Oh, yeah, okay, there's the information on, on the disclaimer. Um, and that's the end of the, the uh, presentations.